Thank you, Sharon, for playing for us. Appreciate very much the accompaniment on the piano. And let's get started here tonight as we start a new chapter in the book of James. James chapter 2 is where we are going to go. Last several weeks, we've been working our way through chapter 1. And as we observed, I, I really think that that chapter is a whole, that he begins with a subject that is the trials and the stretching of the faith of the believer through a variety of circumstance and a variety of potential response. But James is not done stomping on toes. James is going to continue to push the believer in the direction of genuine faith. And he is going to begin dealing with the subject of partiality or favoritism. He's going to deal with interpersonal relationships with one another. Apparently, even in the early church, at least in certain communities, there was a tendency to be uh, a little uh, partial, a little prejudiced. Uh, people were coming from a variety of different backgrounds and economic status. Uh, there were those that were Gentiles, those that were Jews, of course, in some churches, and that often produced uh, some friction. And so James is going to address something here. Uh, he is going to uh, teach us how important it is to treat everyone the way the Lord Jesus Christ would treat everyone. Jesus Christ did not treat people with partiality bias with prejudice he did not show favorites uh, Jesus Christ had his disciples and they were the ones that were going to carry on the work he was investing in them and then of course there were Peter James and John who that he singled out as very close confidants to give them a little bit more information but Jesus Christ thought uh, really uh, gave, uh, gave everyone he he dealt with everyone the same way uh, and so we're going to look at this here together in James chapter 2 if you're there and you could stand with me please as we begin reading in verse 1 of James chapter 2 verse 1 James chapter 2 the Bible says this my brethren have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If he fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless the time that we have in the word of God here uh, this evening. I pray, Lord, that you would work in our hearts as we come to this particular passage and James under inspiration of the Holy Spirit begins to press upon us the importance of interpersonal relationships and being able to uh, engage others uh, with with equality and to remove from our interaction that which is partial or prejudice Lord God we pray that you would minister to each and every heart here this evening and we will give you the praise and the glory for it. For we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. 
James uh, continues to keep things very practical. And as I said, James seems to have a thing for stomping on toes. He seems to go places that we don't really want him to go. He goes places where we actually live. He goes places where we actually do things that maybe we should not do. And here he is putting his finger on it. Really, it is flowing from what he has already introduced as a byproduct of genuine faith. In the previous chapter, he speaks about the true religion what it really means to be a Christian and to demonstrate the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a very natural segue into interpersonal relationships. And again, evidently, in that early church, there were certain congregations that tended to exercise a little bit of that favoritism. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul addresses it with the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there seems to be that same, same problem uh, it was a, really a byproduct of a larger problem that he addresses in the early chapter of 1 Corinthians where he talks about uh, the cliquishness, the clannishness within the church, and it showed itself in things like the observance of the Lord's Supper and how that certain individuals within the church who would come to the, the worship of the Lord would bring a very elaborate meal with themselves and and uh, they would have that as a part of the, the love feast, which was many times attached to observing the Lord's Supper. Uh, and then there were those in the church that didn't have as much, and they kind of ostracized. They were going to have our you know, banana cream pie and our fried chicken, and you can have your, your cheese pizza over there. And, uh, and so uh, there was this sense of aloofness. Uh, there was a, a sense of entitlement. There were certain people in the church that had a lot. They had influence. They had affluence. And particularly in the early days of the church, before persecution became more intense, uh, you would have these, uh, these saints that uh, would kind of uh, hold others that were not of their, soul, their same strata from a, from a financial standpoint at arm's length. And uh, they would treat them differently. And now, I realize that typically in our modern churches, while certainly that can happen, uh, I think many times it's just an idea that when we look at someone, we often pass judgment. We see them on the outside, and maybe they're not wearing a suit and tie. or Maybe they're not dressed in nicest clothes. Maybe they have a stain on their shirt or a hole in their pants. Uh, Maybe their hair uh, is a slightly different shade of color. Or maybe they have a piercing or something. And and we look at them and we automatically begin to pass judgment upon that person. And we say, you know, they probably aren't the kind of people that I want to affiliate with. They're not the people I want to fellowship with. Not the kind of people I want to associate with. And yet they've come to the house of the Lord to worship the Lord. We all, all different. We come from different backgrounds. We have different paths that bring us to the same point. As we were celebrating our brother who just came to the Lord, he's only been in the Lord for about a year and a half, and uh, the Lord brought him on his own journey, and uh, he's had unique experiences. And it would be very easy to, to stand in judgment and say, well, you, you don't you know, do things quite the way I do, and you don't dress the way I dress, and, and you don't talk the way I talk. Okay, that's all fine and good. The fact of the matter is we are one in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we let the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, make the changes to individuals as he sees fit. That's not our place. Matter of fact, that's exactly where James is going. We become judges when we really have no business becoming judges. And so let's take a look at this a little bit more closely uh, here this evening. In that first verse, he says, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, he emphasizes that this is all about our faith and that faith is a very practical thing he's already indicated as much in chapter one and that is going to extend in how i interact with other people have not the faith of our lord jesus christ with respect of persons that phrase respect of persons uh, simply means to have favoritism or to accept by faith in other words i'm looking on the outward and i see them in a certain way And that outward appearance is what I go by. That is what is most important to me. And all my interaction with that person is based upon and predicated upon how they appear. When in reality, what's most important is what I can't see. It is what's on the inside of them. It is their mutual faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, don't have this mindset 
where you are looking on the outside, you're looking on the face of things, and that becomes the litmus test whereby you will either have fellowship with them or you will not have fellowship with them. He says, for their, if they're come, he gives an example, an illustration. In verse 2, if they're come unto your assembly, a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, you get the picture here, uh, and then there comes also a poor man, someone who obviously doesn't have a whole lot, uh, and you treat the one one way and you treat the other the other way, he says, you are guilty of judgmental thoughts. You are guilty of processing things in an unspiritual way. Uh, let's take a look at verse 4, and this is the, the upshot. He says, you are, not, are you not then partial? Uh, are you not discriminating? Are you not judging that person in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts okay uh what james again is driving at is learning how to see people for what they really are in jesus christ now i realize we're not talking about sinful behavior here okay we're not talking about someone who might come into the church and openly display godless behavior immoral behavior that's not what we're talking about when the fruit is corrupt we can assess it as corruptible fruit and we can rebuke it we can reprimand it we can draw attention that that's something that's not right and needs to change but when we're not dealing with moral behavior misbehavior we're not dealing with sin somebody simply dresses differently someone simply speaks a little differently somebody simply acts a little differently comes from a different background that's where we have to be careful that is not our purview uh, to discriminate and to judge against that person. The folly of it is found in our passage here. Uh, he is pointing out that when we do that, when we do that, we're placing the emphasis upon the superficial, not the substantial. He already gives another example. He says, listen, is it not true that the rich do have a tendency to be oppressive toward Christians, and that it is the poor that tend to be more responsive. And I have found that to be true. And we've got to be careful here. The Lord's Spirit will touch any heart that's open, whether they are affluent and wealthy or whether they really have nothing. But experience tells us, and James is experienced in this. Remember, James is likely the lead pastor at the Church of Jerusalem. And that church grew enormously in the first year or two. You had two tremendous messages by Peter where you have as many as 5,000 people coming to that church. And so with that number of people, doubtless you're going to have quite a variety of backgrounds and quite a variety of ethnic differences and so forth. Uh, James was the pastor, I believe, of the first mega church. And, uh, and so he saw firsthand what it was possible to see within the church. And so he said, we need to be careful about this, how we deal with other people. Let's remember that there is something uh, more substantial than what is on the outside. Just the finery on the outside is not what is important, or the lack of that finery. What is important is their mutual faith. Do they have Christ? A legitimate claim to the loving to the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there genuine conversion in that person's life? What's on the outside is not as important. Something else that James, I think, is trying to hammer home to us is that when we play favorites, we are focusing upon the material not the spiritual because that individual has a soul and that soul has a connection with the lord jesus christ just like we do and god is not interested in how much money they have he's not interested in how well they are groomed he is not interested in any of these things he is interested in their heart that is what he's interested in that's what we need to be interested in as I mentioned, it's been my experience that when I go into communities trying to talk to people about the Lord, the more affluent communities tend to be a little bit more cold, colder. 
Uh, they tend to figure, I've got everything I need. Why should I listen to you? You don't have anything to offer me. Whereas you go into poorer communities, and these people obviously, they don't have a whole lot, and many times they know that, and they say, hey, you know, uh, what have I got to lose? I'll listen to you. I had a friend that we would often, uh, he would take me out, and we'd go to uh, some of the transient homes in Missouri, and uh, in Springfield, Missouri, and he would go places where you'd have roaches crawling across the wall, uh, the front door was just a piece of plywood hinge and a hasp on the outside. Uh, they would have a communal bathroom down the hall. And uh, he would just go in there and sit down with these people, and there was no pretense. They knew that they didn't have anything, and he said, he would say, hey, would like to come and talk with you. They said, come on in, sit down. And you just sit on their bed, which was their couch, which was their desk, which was everything, their kitchen. It was all the same thing in that one room. And he would talk to them about the Lord. Um, they understood that they didn't have a whole lot. Many times were more open as a result. And James is simply making this observation. Again, there are exceptions to that. But uh, James is making this observation here that the material is not as important as the spiritual. That uh, when we take a look at the gold ring, let's not forget that there needs to be godly character more than the gold ring. Just because they have all this nice nice stuff doesn't mean that what's on the inside is the way it should be it's the godly character that's more important and then James also is making the observation that when we play favorites we are placing the emphasis upon the temporal as opposed to the eternal this body is going to be gone it is the soul that is going to last forever in other words it's very short-sighted to focus our energies upon how we connect with those that are like us, those that have the similar interests, those that come from the same background. That's very short-sighted because we are going to be spending eternity with each other someplace. We might as well start getting along with each other now because uh, there's going to be a long time together. So let us learn how to open ourselves up in touching the lives of other people. Now, how do you... How do you avoid favoritism? How do you work to, uh, to turn this around? Because it is, it is, I think, a natural part of our human nature. We see somebody that is not like us, and automatically we put up the barriers. Automatically we become a little defensive, a little apprehensive, we're a little concerned. Uh, they don't look like me, they don't dress like me, they don't smell like me, they don't talk like me. Uh, you know, I, I'm just not sure if I can really get along with these people. If they know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are brothers or sisters in Christ. That is a common ground that should actually overcome all of the differences that we have. But James gives us, I think, a few clues. He gives us some thoughts on how it is possible as Christians to overcome or avoid playing favorites down in verse 8 down in verse 8 James says this if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself ye do well the first thing the first thing that James provides is counsel in obeying the royal law. The royal law. And again, he articulates the royal law. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus Christ, he calls it the royal law, I think because Jesus Christ singled it out. It was one of the, the Ten Commandments, uh, so to speak, and when Jesus was questioned, you recall the story, when Jesus was questioned by the Pharisees, they said, well, what's, what's the great commandment? And Jesus Christ said, actually, there are two. The first one, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. The second one is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus Christ drew attention to these two laws, and upon these two laws, he said, everything else rests in hand. You cannot claim to love God and break any of his commandments. And you cannot claim to love your brother as yourself, your neighbor as yourself, if you do anything that harms your brother. 
And so upon these two, everything hangs. So James simply calls it the royal law. The royal law in relationship to other people is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so when we set that as our objective, that is our goal, and we seek to love one another the way that we would love ourselves and choose to be loved, that is the first step in overcoming favoritism. How does that look, though? How does that, sometimes we've got to push ourselves a little bit because we can always say, well, I love everybody the same. It's easy to say it. It's not so easy to act on it, to prove it. What I found helpful for me because I do have a tendency to get in a rut. I have a tendency to um, do things the same way over and over and over again. And one of those areas that I have to be careful of is when I come to church many times, I have a tendency to gravitate toward those that I have established a relationship with. And I come up and I talk to them, and we often continue conversations that we might have started a week before or two weeks before. And what I have to challenge myself to do is to say, you know what? When I come to the house of the Lord, I need to exercise the royal law a little bit more astutely, a little bit more aggressively. When I come to the house of the Lord, I need to look for someone that perhaps I have not spent much time with over the last week or two. Maybe I have never engaged them in any meaningful conversation. So I, I come to church thinking in terms of extending myself towards somebody else stepping outside my comfort zone looking for that person that might be a little different we, we have people come in to Mount View that are visiting for the very first time and I praise God that we have some very friendly people at Mount View that like to engage these but not everybody does and I think it'd be wonderful absolutely wonderful that everyone at Mount View whenever they saw a new face whether they came early and they were already sitting there when you came in, or whether they came late, uh, however they came in, that you made up your mind. We all made up our mind that, you know, before this service is done, before we leave, I am going to engage that person and let them know how much I appreciate them coming and that I look forward to seeing them again. We should be uncomfortable maintaining distance, especially if that person, boy, you know, it's obvious that they... They haven't been saved for a very long time. It's obvious that they uh, may not be a fundamental Christian. Let the Lord worry about that stuff. Let God take care of those things. Our objective is to have a warmth of spirit as we obey the royal law. To come up to individuals and engage them with love and sincerity and say, you know, it's so good to see you here. What's your name? My name is such and such, and, and uh, we're so glad to have you at Mount View. What brings you to our church? We, we hope to see you again. We would love for it to be said that there is no church like Mount View in our community, that you will not see this anywhere else, that this is the place you must come if you want to feel special. If you want people to recognize you as an individual and want to engage you as a fellow believer. And we do have people like that. I'm not saying we don't. But I would love to expand that to every single one so that we already have a mindset. Listen, James says don't play favorites. And by the way, by the way, we can say I'm not playing favorites. I just don't like to engage people. I treat everybody the same way. I just ignore them all. That's not spiritual either. That's not what the Word of God is challenging us to do, okay? Uh, I, I think that every one of us has an obligation in honoring the royal law because Jesus Christ said it, love thy neighbor as thyself. We put ourselves in our shoes. Would we like it if we came to a church and went through the whole service and we walked out and not one person came up to us and said, boy, welcome to this church. We're glad you're here. That should never be the case. It should never be the case. I know that I would feel hurt if I could walk into a church and walk out of church and not one person came up to me or maybe maybe only the pastor because you kind of expect the pastor to do that. You know, you kind of expect an usher, maybe you're a greeter. But to have the general congregation 
Now, and I understand, I, I understand that some people like their space, and we have to be mindful. That some people don't like to be crowded too much, and so we have to read maybe a little body language there. But I think that I would rather err on the side of warmth and sincerity and love than conversely to where, well, they might be offended if I come up and shake their hand because they might think I have germs or I might be getting into their space or maybe they just want to kind of hide in the corner and they don't want any people to draw attention. I know there are people like that. Um, but I think most people like a little attention. I mean, I know I like a little attention. Uh, I think we all do like a little bit of attention. Grace, do you like attention on your birthday party? Yeah. It would be terrible to have a birthday party and nobody ever talked to the birthday girl, right? They ignored you and they played with the balloons and they ate the cake and, and uh, they walked out, right? It's nice to have people pay attention to you, isn't it? It is. And so I think that we have this as a means of uh, really a, a, a practical objective that as a church we grow together in this mindset that we don't just come and take off that we look for folks to engage in and to be pleasant to and to love in the name of the lord and expand expand that realm of influence again we do have our favorites if you will people in common you know we things that we we like to talk about and there's nothing wrong with that but we don't want to limit it to that we want to broaden it Sometimes that I found it helpful to actually consciously make a goal that I am going to talk to three people that I have not talked to last Sunday, this Sunday. That when I get there, I'm going to look for these people and I'm going to ask, Lord, you lay them on my heart and I'll say, oh, Sister Betty, I didn't talk to Sister Betty last week. I want to talk to Sister Betty. Brother Chuck, I saw Brother Chuck last week, but we didn't really talk at all. I want to spend some time sitting with and talking to Brother Chuck. And I really want to spend some time with Kaipo over here because Kaipo comes in and Kaipo goes out and I've not talked to Kaipo, I want to talk to Kaipo. And so when we have that as a goal, objective, we are taking practical steps to fulfill the royal law. But then James says there's something else we can do. Something else we can do in verse 9. He says, but if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin." and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Now, this is going to be a segue into something else that he's going to, once again, stomp on our toes a little bit. But here in verse 9, I believe James is challenging us to critique ourselves. To step back and critique ourselves. To recognize when we are cultivating a bad habit. When we're doing something that we should not be doing. He says, if you have partiality, if you respect people on the face, if it is all about the surface, if it's all about the finery, if it's all about the connection, the emotional tie, and it really has nothing about pouring yourself into the life of somebody else, investing in them, critique yourself and recognize it for what it is. Recognize that it is actually a display of sin as far as God is concerned. That when we are selfish with our time, when we behave in a way that excludes others, when we stiff arm other people, whether it's physically or emotionally or mentally, however it might be, we are actually sinning against the Lord. Remember the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 17. His prayer, part of that prayer was about the unity that he wanted to see cultivated within the saints. He wanted to see a oneness as they drew closer, not just to the Lord himself, which was the centerpiece, but as they grew closer to the Lord, they also grew closer to one another. They also began to see each other in a different light. They began to prize the fellowship with one another. And so being able to step back and analyze ourselves and think, okay, Am I treating others with favoritism? Am I unconsciously holding some at arm's length while embracing others? Do I, without really trying, tend to avoid certain people because they make me uncomfortable? 
Or do I meet them head on and recognize that they are a child of God just like I am? And that I need to show love and respect to them and show that they are family. James said, if you don't do that, if you don't take time to critique yourself, to step back and see, hey, I am playing favorites here a little bit. I am showing favoritism certain people that i spend time with certain people that i do not spend time with he says that's sin when you do that you are committing sin and as a result he says you are becoming a transgressor of the law allow the holy spirit to bring conviction take it to the lord say lord god i want to display the love of jesus christ i want to obey the royal law i want to love my neighbor as myself but I'm selfish. I, I, I'm shy. I don't like to talk to people. Whatever the excuse might be, and it is a, an excuse. You know, I, I've told you before that when I was a teenager, I was painfully shy. And I was told by my parents, that actually is pride. And what you are doing is you are giving the impression that you are too good for other people. And that wasn't what was in my mind. But that's what people were taking away. And so it took a conscientious effort on my part to come out of myself and recognize that if I'm going to love others as I should, I'm going to have to become a little vulnerable. I'm going to have to engage in conversations that might be a little awkward because I'm not as familiar. There are things that you folks know here that I have no clue about. But that should not prevent me from engaging you in fellowship because that's how I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn some things. I've talked with people about some things that they're engaged in, things that they do. And while it's not something that I know much about, or maybe I'm not even interested in, I'm learning things. And more importantly, I'm showing that they are worth my attention. I want to spend time talking with them. I want to get to know them a little bit better. That's how you cultivate relationship. Another way of helping in this respect, by the way, is learning to be a good listener and ask a lot of questions ask questions you know most of us don't have a lot of trouble telling people what's important and what's interesting to ourselves you know we love to tell everybody about the things that interest us well there's a word for that that's becoming a bore when all we do is talk about ourselves that is showing you're being a bore but when you start asking questions, so how was your day? So, so what do you do during the week? Uh, what is your job like? Um, how long have you been working there? You begin to ask questions. How long have you known the Lord as your Savior? Has the Lord taught you anything in, in, your, in your devotions this past week? How are things going? You begin to ask questions and you listen. You're showing interest in that other person. That brings you out of yourself and it fulfills the royal law. But we have to sometimes take stock. Be a, a critic of ourselves. Am I doing that? Am I, am I approachable? Am I approaching others? Am I showing interest in other people? This really is the drive of James. James, as a pastor, has a pastor's heart. He has a huge church that he is ultimately responsible for. And he wants to see people get along. He wants to see the church come together. He wants to see unity, but he knows that with that many people, we're going to have all sorts of friction. We've got Jews and we've got Gentiles. We've got rich people, we've got poor people. We've got smart people, we've got stupid people. How do you get all these people together? It's simple. Bring them together in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the great unifier. But we must be willing, willing, to obey the royal law and critique ourselves critique ourselves look inside and say am i the kind of christian the lord would have me to be for others this is what james is driving at of course this is going to set up what he has next but my prayer is that this has been a an encouragement and a blessing and uh, a challenge challenge to all of us as we see an encouragement to other people and touch them as well, treating everyone uh, with the same deference if they are in the Lord Jesus Christ, showing interest 
uh, in each other as the Lord would have us to do. Remember this. Jesus Christ never turned away anyone who needed Him. And who needed Him? The lepers, those possessed of unclean spirits, those who were sick and infirm, people that, generally speaking, we would try to avoid. Oh, they've got a handicap, or <clears throat> they have some spiritual struggles they're going through, or they have some sort of an ugly disease. We have folks in our church, they come, and they have disabilities. They have walkers, they have wheelchairs. Uh, sometimes we'll have you know, the music singing, playing, and we'll shake a few hands. Let's remember not to forget them. It's easy when they're kind of sitting in the corner because they typically have to be kind of out of the way. It's easy to shake everybody else's hand and you forget brother so-and-so over here or sister so-and-so back there or brother so-and-so over here because they can't get up and move around like we can. And to say, you know what, I next time I see sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, I'm going to let them know. Because think about this. For many of us, coming and going is relatively easy. We get in the car. We drive somewhere, we get out, we walk in. But not everybody has that ability to just get out and go where they want. Some people, it is a major task just to go to church. They have to get themselves into the car, need to put their walker in, need to drive there, get out, work their way into the church. Sometimes they have a lift vehicle. Who knows? It's a major investment of time and effort. And what a beautiful thing to come up to those people and say, you know what, I just want you to know that I appreciate seeing you here. I know it's not always easy for you to get here, but man, it's a blessing to see your face here at church. Just simple things that we can do. And I think these are things that James would see us do uh, as he writes these words. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless as we close our service here this evening. I pray that you would use the Word of God to speak to our hearts continually throughout this week. And Father, that we might indeed obey the royal law, that we would love one another as we would be loved ourselves. And Father, that we would be very, very harsh critics of our own spirituality, recognizing that you have expectations for your children. And uh, to realize that when we play favorites, when we resist the fellowship with others because they might be a little different, we are actually sinning against you. And Father, I pray that we would not be guilty of that and that you'd take us from this place with your blessing. For we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.